Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our program, Black History of Maine with Bob Green at the Lewiston Public Library. My name is Izzy, and I'm the Adult Services Library Technician here at LPL. I'm so happy to see so many of you logging on from both Zoom and Facebook. Bob has an excellent presentation for us tonight about the rich history of Black people in our state. There will be time at the end for questions. For those on Zoom, please use the Q&A feature to send in your questions. And for those on Facebook, please type your questions in the comments and a member of our staff will relay them to our speaker here on Zoom. Now a little bit about our presenter. Bob Green is the eighth generation of his family to be born in Cumberland County, making his roots in Maine stretch back into the 1700s. A graduate of Portland High School, Bob went off to college in a career in journalism. After retiring, he returned home to Maine where his genealogical research led him to a deep knowledge of Maine's black history. Currently, he teaches a Black History of Maine course at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Southern Maine. Bob was also the 2021 recipient of the Maine Historical Society's Neil Allen Award, which is presented each year for ex exceptional contributions to Maine history. And so with that, I hope you all will join me in welcoming Bob Crane. Thank you and good evening. Before I begin, I would like to thank Izzy Ruda and the Lewiston Public Library for inviting me to speak this evening. I am delighted to have this opportunity. Years ago, right after we bought our first television set, my wife and I saw a newfangled item that was quite unique. It was sold as a TV light, something you needed so you didn't really sit in the dark staring at that black and white screen but it was also another new thing in our life, a digital clock, one in which leaves drop down to cover up the old minutes and hours. The first time my mother-in-law saw it, she asked what it was. When we told her it was a clock, her response was, how do you tell time with that? We laughed today. We have digital this and digital that, a huge number of people are, like me, wearing a digital wristwatch. We laugh, but how many children today can tell time with this? You're sitting here wondering, how does this fit in with Black History of Maine? Well, it does and it doesn't. You see, all of us have a tendency to look at today when we talk about the past. My mother-in-law's view of a digital clock was something quite new to her at that time. So today we laugh. Digital timepieces are everywhere. But when we are talking about the 1800s and Lewiston, Maine, we are a humongous distance from I-95 and automobiles and telephones and street lights and almost anything that is part of our today. We're talking about a time when the only ways of traveling were by boat, a horse, or by foot. Stop to think what that really means. There's a reason the world's major cities are all on water and reachable by boat. And that's the reason the major cities in Maine, even to the mid 1800s, were ports. While Portland and Bath and Brunswick and Camden and Eastport quickly come to mind, in the 1800s, ocean-going ships were docking at those major main ports in Augusta and Hollowell, as well as Bangor and Brewer. Lewiston, on the other hand, had to wait until somebody rode a horse or walked to this area. And they did, eventually. Paul Hildreth was the first to settle in Lewiston in 1770. But it wasn't until 1849 when the Androscoggin and Kennebec Railroad showed up and connected Lewiston to the world. The next year, the president of the Union Pacific Railroad, Benjamin Bates, arrived in Lewiston and began building the Bates Manufacturing Company. The rest, as they say, is history. 
thousands of Canadians and European immigrants flooded to Lewiston, where the mills became Maine's largest employer for three decades. And in 1855, the Maine State Seminary opened in Lewiston to educate the working class and provide an education for Blacks and women. It was the first co-educational college in New England and one of the earliest proponents of abolitionism. Oh yeah, nine years after it was created, the Maine State Seminary changed its name to Bates College. That was one year after Lewiston officially became a city in 1863. While there may have been a few black folks in the area, Cuff Chambers and his wife Betsy lived in Leeds along with a few others, it wasn't until the end of the Civil War before black folks as a group found their way to what is today the second largest city in the state of Maine. The best known black of that era was probably George Washington Kemp, the patriarch of the family that traveled around New England as a singing group. General Oliver Otis Howard of Leeds gets the credit, but the man who actually brought George Washington Kemp to Maine was the general's brother, Major Charles Henry Howard. A year later, General Howard, it was General Howard who located Kemp's wife and children in Virginia and reunited the family. This photograph of George Washington Kemp comes courtesy of one of his descendants who lives in the area today. It is thanks to Elaine Kemp Bragdon that we know so much about the wonderful history of this man and his family. But the Kemp's weren't the only ones leaving Virginia and moving to Maine. Mary Taylor, the 1870 federal census tells us an interesting story on how soldiers from Maine returned home after the Civil War, bringing with them former slaves. Although we're not talking big numbers, it was the first time a group of Blacks showed up in Androscoggin County, and they had a lot in common. Mary Taylor was born in 1847 in Virginia making her 23 years old by the time of the 1870 census. Note that she is listed as black and her occupation is domestic. The census tells us there are three things Mary Taylor has in common with the other southerners. They are black, a number are natives of Virginia, and most are general laborers of one type or another. In 1870, Coladmus Mason was 16 years old and working as a farmer in Lisbon Falls. 17-year-old Charlie Carey is working on the farm of Samuel and Elizabeth Moore. The last name of the Leeds family is misspelled in the 1870 census. John Thornton is 18 and is working on a farm, this one in Lewiston and owned by Noah Litchfield. Vena Coles is a 19 year old mother of an infant who is not even named, but a closer inspection of this 1870 census does allow us a brief and upsetting look into the past. Both Vena Coles and her one month old son are listed as living on the farm owned by Coffin McAfee, a native of Canada who is married and the father of three children. Also living in the house are 25 other people, all listed as city paupers. This is literally the poor farm. And in the case of Vena Coles, it is almost certain that she and her newborn were listed as paupers upon the death of her husband. Another woman living in the same house and also listed as a pauper was 36-year-old Ellen Smith. 
She was born in Ireland and accompanied by her two children, ages 15 and three. Until Social Security, this is what happened to poor families when the breadwinner died. Anna Davis was also born in Virginia. She was 27 years old in 1870 and listed as the housekeeper in a rooming house owned by Perna Colon. Anna was one of four blacks listed in the home. There's Anna's five month old son, Willie, along with Aaron Hopkins of Louisiana and John Nichols of North Carolina. Unlike most of the other former slaves, Arnsley Johnson arrived in Lewiston with a skill. The 25 year old was a hostler, a stable man who takes care of horses. According to the census, Johnson was literate, meaning he could read and write. He was the only black among three men who were boarders in the house owned by Rosilla Knowlton a 54-year-old native of Maine. According to John Nichols, he and several other Blacks were brought to the state by Alonzo Garcelon of Lewiston, an army doctor who later became governor of Maine. Nichols said Garcelon and several of his doctor friends wanted Black workers. In its April 16, 1921 magazine section, the Lewiston Evening Journal printed the story of John Nichols' escape from slavery through the great dismal swamp that stretches from Elizabeth City, North Carolina to Norfolk, Virginia. A large portion of the article was reprinted in the book, Maine's Visible Black History. Although I don't quite know what to make of it, but I, I find it very interesting that of all the black folks I've mentioned, only Anna Davis was marked in the census as being unable to read or write. Two others, Vina Coles and George Washington Kemp were said to have been unable to write, although they may have been able to read. The book, Maine's Visible Black History, co-authored by two friends of mine, H. H. Price and Gerald Talbert, and published in 2006, remains the first and now one of only two state black histories that have been published. The book shows that between 1820 and 1870, a period of only 50 years, Blacks were living in 274 towns in Maine, including Lewiston, Auburn, and several other Androscoggin County communities. Now, although they were here, Africans and their descendants have never been a big portion of Maine's population. While I've so far presented a pretty upbeat portrait of Maine and its people of and African ancestry, I don't want you to leave thinking this state has been the perfect host. Educator and Arthur Patricia Walls has found nearly 500 enslaved people in the towns of Old Kittery and Berwick in colonial times. She published the study in her book, Lives of Consequence. The book is available at Longfellow Bookstore in Portland as well as the Maine Historical Society's bookstore. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Lewiston area, for the most part, was late welcoming people with African ancestry. But what is now Maine was among the first in the Western Hemisphere to have a Black presence. Matau da Costa actually was here 12 years before the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock. Da Costa served as an interpreter for a group of French explorers that included Samuel de Champlain, the guy for whom the lake is named. 
Da Costa is believed to have been fluent in Dutch, English, French, Portuguese, Mi'kmaq, and Pigeon Basque, and is known to have been sought by both the English and the Dutch to help in their contacts with Aboriginal peoples in North America. And he wasn't the only one. A 1672 court document describes Anthony, a black man. Anthony was Dr. Antonio Slamy and may have been Maine's first doctor. John Brown Restward became just the third black to graduate from college in the United States when in 1826, he gave the commencement speech at Bowdoin where his classmates included Nathaniel Hawthorne and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Russworm later was the co-editor of a black newspaper before he immigrated to Liberia where he became the first black governor of that African nation. A native of Cape Verde, Narcissus Matias arrived in Bangar in 1834. At one time, he had seven wagons delivering baggage and express packages in Bangar, the FedEx or UPS of his day. He also owned and drove the first coach, a nine-seater bus owned by a private individual in the Queen City. He was a member of the Bangor Fire Department and the first man in Bangor to deliver ice to individual customers. One of his grandsons, Frederick Dick Mathias, was the first block to graduate from the University of Maine, Orono. Robert Benjamin Lewis was born in Pittston in 1802. He held three United States patents, including one machine to caulk the seams of wooden ships in order to make them watertight. The hair picker became a mainstay of Maine shipyards for years. Lewis also wrote the first world history book from a viewpoint of African-Americans and Native Americans entitled Light and Truth. Macon Bolin Allen became the first African-American lawyer in the United States when he passed the bar exam in Portland in 1844. He later moved to Boston where he became the first black to become a justice of the peace. James Augustine Healy was the oldest of 10 children born to Irishman Michael Healy and his slave wife, Mary Eliza. James was valedictorian of the first graduating class at Holy Cross College in 1849. And in 1875, he became the first African-American Catholic Bishop in the United States when Pope Pius IX named him to that post in Portland. Under Healy's administration, membership in the Catholic Church in his jurisdiction of Maine and New Hampshire doubled to about 100,000. The bishop's brother, Patrick Healy, was president of Georgetown University. When he retired from that post, he moved to Portland to help his brother bring more Mainers into the flock. But it's not just long, long ago that people of color have contributed greatly to our state. Three internationally known artists have had roots in Maine. Daniel Mentor lives in Portland. His work can be seen in the official logos of the Maine Freedom Trails, the Underground Railroad, and the Maine Interfaith Youth Alliance. Minter also has designed two Kwanzaa stamps for the United States Post Office and teaches illustration at the Maine College of Art. In 1962, Ashley Bryan became the first African-American to publish a children's book 
as both an author and illustrator. Brian now lives on Cranberry Isle. The late David Driscoll was a recipient of the National Humanities Medal. He first came to Maine in 1953 to attend the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. He bought a home in Thalmond and split his time between Maine and Maryland before he died of coronavirus. Among other posts Susan Rice held in the Obama administration was US ambassador to the United Nations. She is the daughter of Lois Dixon Rice, a native of Portland who helped persuade Congress to provide federal subsidies known as Pell Grants to tens of millions of college students. Barbara Nichols was born in Waterville and grew up in both Augusta and Portland. She became the first black to be elected president of the American Nurses Association. And she is still the only non-white to hold that position. Barbara went on to head up a, an international company and is currently teaching nursing at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Joyce Gibson, is the Dean of USM's Lewiston Auburn campus, the school's top officials here in the LA area. She is the recipient of the Marianne Hartman Award, which honors Maine women who have contributed to the quality of our lives by their work in arts, politics, business, education, healthcare, or community service. Craig Hickman of Winthrop served three terms in the main house and is now a state senator. Rachel Talbert Ross is a state representative from Portland following in the footsteps of her father, Gerald Talbert, who was the first black elected to the Maine legislature. A ninth generation Mainer, Rachel serves the Democratic caucus as assistant house majority leader. Dr. Richard Evans is serving his first term in the main house where he is representing Dover Foxcroft. Now there were other black folks who have impacted Maine and its history. William Burney, served two four-year terms as mayor of Augusta. He also was inducted into the Maine Basketball Hall of Fame for his exploits while at Coney High School. Jill Dusen worked for almost 15 years for Central Maine Power and Northern Utilities in various management positions before she entered politics. She was on the Portland City Council, where she twice served as mayor of Maine's largest city. Born in Somalia, Deca Delac became a United States citizen in 1998. She received international publicity recently when she became the first African-American and the first Muslim to become mayor of South Portland. and my favorite politician is well known in the Lewiston Auburn area. A native of Newark, New Jersey, John Jenkins came to Maine in 1970 to attend Bates College. After earning a degree in psychology, he traveled the world participating in martial arts competition. He won his first world championship in karate in Japan in 1977, and later won four more world championships in karate and one in jujitsu. In 1993, Jenkins was elected mayor of Lewiston by a three to one margin. He then was elected as Maine's first black to serve in the state Senate. 
in 2008, he was elected mayor of Auburn. When Jenkins decided not to seek reelection, his name was not on the ballot. But voters in Auburn elected Jenkins anyway, with a write-in vote total that was more than all of those on the ballot combined. He was only 68 years old when he died in September 2020. Born in Portland, the late Beverly Dodge Bowens became a nurse and a hospital administrator. While at Portland High, she wanted to join the senior class trip to Washington, D.C., only to find Blacks were not allowed to stay in hotels in the nation's capital. With the help of Maine Senator Margaret Chase Smith, Beverly broke that color barrier and joined her classmates at their hotel. Because of discrimination, Americans never heard of the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. That has changed dramatically since several movies have been made about the exploits of the all black outfit known as the Red Tails. Two Tuskegee Airmen had ties to Maine. Eugene Jackson was the only Maine native to serve with the Red Tails. He died at his Massachusetts home in 2015. And Jim Shepard was the only Tuskegee Airman to live in Maine after the war. A native of New York City, Jim moved to Maine to head up the FAA office at the Portland International Jet Port. He lived in Westbrook and South Portland before his death in 2018. There's one great story to tell about our two Tuskegee Airmen. Gene Jackson was speaking at the University of Southern Maine. His topic was growing up black in Portland. Attending the talk was Jim Shepard. After which Shepard questioned Jackson about wearing a Tuskegee Airmen cap. Jim said he knew all of the Tuskegee Airmen and he didn't know Jackson. In their discussion, however, they realized they knew the same people. Two weeks later, Jim Shepard received a letter from Eugene Jackson that included this picture. It had been taken in Italy during a brief break from the fighting in World War II. Thomas Douglas moved to Maine in 2004 to practice law with a mid-sized firm in Portland. He now is a partner in his own law firm in Westbrook. Several years ago, he won a major case when the Maine Supreme Court ruled that national fraternities have a legal duty to prevent sexual misconduct by their members at chapter-sponsored events. Tom also plays guitar and bass and performs with several music groups. Shay Stewart Booley lives on Peaks Island and is executive director of Community Change Inc., a faith-based nonprofit in Southern Maine. She also is a writer known for her blog titled Black Girl in Maine. Dr. Florence Edwards graduated from Portland High and attended the University of New England before going to dental school at Howard University in New York, uh, in Washington, D.C., excuse me. After a stint in the U.S. Army, Dr. Flo returned to Portland, where she practices dentistry and serves on the board of Equality Maine. Then there are the newest African-Americans who have arrived in Maine in more recent years. Pius Ali is the first African native to be elected to the Portland School Board and then to the Portland City Council. A native of Ghana, Ali is also founder and executive director of Maine Interfaith Youth Alliance. 
director and co-founder of the King Fellows, and has been involved in several other organizations, including Seeds of Peace. Although Angela Okafor earned a law degree in her native Nigeria and passed the bar exam in New York, she was unable to get a job in the legal field. So she washed dishes to earn a living. That was before she opened her own law practice, an international market, and a hair care business in Bangor. Oh yeah, she's now a member of the Bangor City Council. Then there's Lewiston's own Sophia Kalyan. When she was seven years old, Safiya and her family fled the war in Somalia. At the age of 14, she became an American citizen. 10 years later, Safiya became the first Somali American and the youngest person ever to be elected to the Lewiston City Council. Her roots are firmly in Lewiston, where she graduated from high school. Or as Safiya put it, quote, Lewiston is where I learned to write by name and where I received an education through the public school system, end quote. A native of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Claude Rwanji has been elected to the Westbrook City Council. Claude also is the founder and executive director of Prosperity Maine in Portland. Born in Haiti, Tanya Jean-Jacques was raised in Montreal, Canada, and came to the United States to complete her college degree in nursing. After her husband, who is a cardiologist, found a job in Hampton, Tanya ran for it and was elect elected to the Camden School Board. A native of Darfur, Sudan, Eklis Ahmed resettled in Portland in 2005. Since then, she has graduated from high school with honors and earned her college degree in sociology. Besides teaching at Westbrook Middle School, she is vice president and co-founder of a nonprofit organization, Darfur Youth of Tomorrow. Adele Masingo Nyoy has been a professor, had been a professor in her native Democratic Republic of the Congo. But when she arrived in Portland in 2000 as a refugee and single mother, Adele couldn't speak English and felt hopeless and lost. Now she is a fashion designer and founder of Adele Masingo Designs. She also founded Women United Around the World an organization that promotes the leadership development of female immigrants, teaches sewing, and provides connection in the community for new immigrants. But I don't have to tell this audience about our state's newest African-American citizens. They have helped revitalize Lewiston's downtown area and were a big part of Lewiston's high school state soccer championship team in 2018. Yes, these newest arrivals are stepping solidly into the footsteps of those blacks who came into main ports on sailing ships so long ago. Thank you. All right. Wow, that was a lot. I don't think anybody in here could say that they didn't learn something, so thank you. So we'll move on to the Q&A portion. Uh, just so folks uh, know, a reminder for you all, if anybody came late, we are gonna be doing the question and answer portion through the Q&A feature in Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, go ahead and type it into the comments on Facebook, and we have a staff member here who will relay that to us here. All right, we do have a couple of questions already in. Uh, this first one is in response to a statement you made at the beginning of the presentation that Lewiston was inaccessible by water. Um, they asked, what about the Androscoggin River? If you note that uh, Lewiston's power comes from the falls in Lewiston, you cannot take a boat that far river up, up the Androscoggin. 
you can take it all the way up to at least Durham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, not accessible by ships, I think, is really <laughs> what we're focused on. All right, and then it says the descendants of George Washington Kemp married into the Wing family who had migrated up from Cape Cod when Henry Washington married Rosie Ellen. How common and how acceptable were such mixed marriages in the state of Maine in the early 1900s? You're right. It was apparently common and acceptable. Uh, you find it all, all around the state. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, I can think of the eight, uh, London Adis in, in uh, oh, way up north in, in in, in Maine, married a white woman and, and raised a family, a big family. They call the area Adisville. Uh, another one was uh, Beverly Truman in Norway, married a local girl there and they had 11 children. Uh, this, and you find mixed marriages throughout the state of Maine. A lot of that, I guess, has to do with the fact there weren't too many available people around to marry. <laughs> Right. Uh, do you think that Bishop Healy knew about the history of Georgetown and its implications in the enslaved trade? They would suggest no, but it is rather ironic. I would uh, go along with that suggestion and say, I don't think so either. Uh, but you never know, and it is ironic. So then we have a question. I'm an educator in rural Maine. Do you have any recommend recommendations for sources I can share with my students about Black history in Maine? I'd love to share this history with them. Yes, if you're fortunate, your local library has a copy of Maine's Visible Black History. That's a good start and uh, very thorough. Um, also, if you contact the local library, have them call me. I'd be happy to talk to them. Uh, were the black folks brought up for Virginia paid servants? Uh, I don't know. You know, uh, I mean, they, they were paid hands, yes, if that's what you're talking about. The, the problem is we don't know, we, we see. Now, if you notice, they were listed as farmers or farm hands or laborers, and I'm pretty sure they were paid. Um, we have one in Cape Elizabeth, who I found in 1860 census when she was nine years old, she was a servant. She remained a servant with that family until 1920s when she died. So it was over 60 years that she was listed as a servant in that family. All I can go with is what the uh, census tells us, although I sometimes wonder. Bob, great talk. Will you speak about how your family first came to Maine? I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, I can trace my family back to 1783, mar a wedding, a marriage in New Gloucester in 1783. According to the New England Historical and Genealogical uh, people, uh, the groom was born in Maine in 1750. But I have never been able to find out where they're from or, or anything about them. They're just two people show up and get married, period. He was, he was from uh, New Gloucester and she's listed as being from Falmouth. That's all I know. So another question about your own genealogical research into your family in Maine. Um, yes, I, uh, back in 1990, well, I should explain that. I, I left to go to college. I ended up at the University of Kansas. And so I got married and my children were all born in the Midwest. And they knew my father. My father's originally from Kansas City. They knew his family. They did not know my mother's family. My mother is from Maine. 
one of the things that I have found since the 1783 marriage is that it was women that stayed in Maine and they married men from away. And my mother was that way. She married a guy from Kansas City. Well, my children grew up knowing my dad's family and they didn't have a lot of children. My mother's family on the other hand was quite prolific. And, and so uh, I started actually my, my genealogical research trying to find out who, where, why, and how all of my relatives came to be. All right. Please talk about Maine's exploitation of enslaved individuals. What types of work did enslaved people do in Maine? The enslaved people that I presume you're talking about uh, in Pat Wall's book, Lives of Consequence. I really don't know. Pat Wall is the expert of that, and I'm sure she would be very happy to enlighten you. I, on the other hand, have uh, tried to find out what's happened after the slavery. The only ones that, well, there are few. I found a, a family, I can't think of the name right now, a family of 10 in Bristol, Maine, in 1820, they're listed as slaves, all of them. In 1830, they're listed as free. Uh, so I don't know what type of work enslaved people did in Maine. Mm -hmm. all right. uh, this, Nancy says, I'm an interpretive designer working with a land trust to create a sign about Bishop Healy on Little Diamond Island. I've been told, I do not have evidence, that he and his siblings inherited wealth from his father when his slaves were sold off, and that Bishop Healy's mother was enslaved. Uh, his, the mother was a slave, and uh, he loved her so much, they apparently were married. By the way, I, I only mentioned two, uh, Bishop Healy and his brother Patrick, they had a, a sister who was the first black mother superior up in Vermont. Uh, they had another brother who decided not to stay at Holy Cross and instead became a seaman. And at one point, he was head of what is now the, the Coast Guard in, in, in um, Alaska. And right now, the U.S. Coast Guard has an icebreaker named the Healy for that brother. All right. All right. Let's see. And this is a, a comment. Maybe Bob, such mixed marriages were because of love, in reference to our previous conversation. Uh, you know, I, I I said that there weren't a lot of people around, and so. But yes, yes, I, I have to agree that some of the, I mean, I don't think anybody, well, that's not true either. I don't think many would, would go into a marriage. And these marriages, by the way, lasted a long time. Uh, you'll see where 32, 40, 50 years is very, so they, la they last until death. And Betty says, why do you say the light at the end of the tunnel has been turned off? I can think of many reasons, but you? <laughs> I happen to like that side. <laughs> to, it, to, uh, to just say that this is the end of, of, of my program. Yeah. All right. And what can explain the rise of KKK 1920s and Malaga Island events when Maine appeared to be so tolerant? Tolerant is only where you are at the time. Uh, I'm sure that throughout Maine, you find non-tolerance going on. The Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s throughout the country had a resurgence. Maine was no different. In Maine, because we have so few blacks, 
uh, the Ku Klux Klan main uh, victims were Catholics and Jews, although Blacks did come under some pressure too. Um, Malaga Island is, uh, you have to go into kind of a, a, a little bit of a story there. You have to understand that this country did not have a middle class until the Civil War. It was only after the Civil War where there were a group of people who had enough money and had time that they could spend it in leisure. Before that, you worked. It was mouth, you know, paycheck to paycheck, so to speak. But with that leisure class, all of a sudden, people wanted to leave the hot cities like New York and Boston. If you remember any of the movies that you've ever seen of, of early uh, New York, you see a lot of people sitting out on fire escapes at, at night trying to get some air. It was before air conditioning. So the middle class after the Civil War had enough money that at least the women and children could spend the summer in cooler climes where there was some air. And if you'll notice that this is where a number of communities were, were built. The really rich decided to build their little cottages in Newport, Rhode Island. But this is where the Black Point Inn in Scarborough came at that time. And this is where a number of others all up and down the, the, the Eastern seaboard, north of Boston, they came in with these places that you could get some air, stay away from the, the hot cities. And it was this time period when real estate speculators decided that Malaga Island would be the perfect place for one of these uh, summer rest homes, if you want to call them that. And that was all part of it. And so the state came in and kicked, kicked the people there off unceremoniously and took, made sure that all of the buildings were also torn down or taken with them. So as it turned out, of course, this happened in 1912, but as it turned out, nothing was ever really done. And right now, Malaga Island looks just like it did in 1912 after all of the people were kicked off. And by the way, uh, it's now loaded. You can go out there and, and take a look if you wish. It's a park basically, <laughs> but I'll tell you this, you gotta be a little careful because it's filled with poison ivy. <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, by Portland, my understanding is there were, was a significant African-American population here. Can you comment what happened to the African-American neighborhood here? You know, it, the, the black population of Maine is, is interesting. Uh, during, when we traveled by sail, Maine, Portland was a day closer to Europe than Boston by sail. And we had the wood for to build ships. The first ship, by the way, the first ship built by Europeans in what is now the United States was built in Maine the same year that Jamestown was found. So we've always had that uh, ability and that connection. Blacks came to Maine to work on the ships, whether it be actually as a sailor or a cook or a steward, or whether it be as a longshoreman. Blacks were the main uh, workers on, on the uh, docks on the Atlantic and, and Gulf Coast uh, ships yards until the Irish came. So that's not that unusual. The next group of blacks came 
after, and we're talking about, I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about groups. The next ones basically came after the Civil War. That's where they came into Lewis and, and other places. Because by then we're in, remember uh, the Monitor and the Merrimack, we're now into, in, into iron ships and that are powered by steam. So no longer do we need the wood that Maine was furnishing. And now Maine drops as far as needing people, having jobs. And so blacks along with whites left, go to Boston or Philly or New York to find jobs. As I said, the next group comes after the Civil War. But once there are no jobs, that group goes to where the jobs are. The next big group comes in during World War II when we have the shipyards in Portland. And after the shipyards closed, there were no other jobs. And so blacks, along with a lot of whites, left to find jobs. They're now just starting to come back again, but now is a whole different reason. And most of them coming back now are, uh, well, a lot of them that are coming back now, not necessarily most, but a lot that are coming back now are African refugees who are, who found Maine is safe compared to the countries they have left or some of the places they had been earlier in the United States. The, the African-American neighborhood in, in Portland, the, they died or left for jobs. I know uh, I'm just trying to think about on my block uh, that I grew up on Munjoy Hill, we had, oh, I would say one, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, there were at least 10 black families in on my block. And I don't think there are any there now. All right. Uh, next question asks if you have information about mariners in early Maine and Massachusetts who were involved in bringing blacks to Maine. I don't really. Uh, yeah. I've been going through the various census and other things, trying to find who people were and what they did, where they came from, that type of thing. But uh, I am, like I said, Maine was a beehive of activity for shipping, especially in the day of sail and wooden ships. Uh, it's not so much now. However, what people don't realize is that the port of Portland right now is larger and has always been larger than Boston. All right. Do you have any information regarding Robert's family, possibly derived from Orrin Foy? I know about both. I don't know enough to tell you any more information than names right now. And then statement from Facebook, interesting in, interesting in seeing all the contemporary representation of African-Americans in Maine. I began a study of black pioneers in Maine over 30 years ago. My focus is on genealogy and my cutoff date is about 1850. I went through published histories, censuses, deeds, probate and church records. I spent time with Gerald Talbot and had info on his ancestors who came from Massachusetts. It has been a rewarding study. I may have some info on the Ruby family. Remember this, remember that Maine was the main district of Massachusetts up until 1820. So it's not surprising that the Talberts and others uh, came up from, from Massachusetts. I have some of my family that did too, from the early years. Um, I'm glad, continue that and please share your, your uh, product with others.
I would love to hear about it, especially about the Ruby family, which is my family. Thank you. Another one, I'm doing research on a black woman born in likely in 1760s and likely enslaved by a shipbuilder's family in Kittery. She was free in Hillsborough um, Company in, in County in late 1780s. Could she have simply walked away emancipating herself? It seems unlikely she would have been freed by this family. Did, simply, did people simply walk away? Of course, I would imagine. I, you know, I don't know for sure, but just thinking about it, I, I would think that if you really were upset and wanted to, you could walk away. The question is whether they found you again. But I mean, you, you talk about people like Frederick Douglass. They, we talk about slaves running away. They could simply have walked. I mean, this is, this is what the Underground Railroad was all about. This is what uh, Harriet Tubman going down, getting people and running away or walking away. Yes, that's simply that. Yes, I think so. And what was the name of the Bristol family in 1820, 1830? You would ask, it's in my computer and I can't remember it right now. I'll tell you what, um, anybody can write me at mebear1. That's like Maine Bear, M-E-B-E-A-R, and the numeral one at gmail.com. You send me a question on that, I'll find it and, and give it to you. Be more than happy to. Thank you. And can you comment on the history of the Black population from China, Maine? I'm related to George Washington Seawall, who was born there in 1828. Most census identifies him as white, but one identifies him and his children as mixed race. Yeah, <laughs> um, I can't really comment. They, there were a number of blacks that lived in China, Maine. By the way, the, the original name of China was Harlem and it has nothing to do with the community in New York City. It was named for the same reason that community was named. That is from the, from the uh, city in the Netherlands, Harlem. Uh, I would not be surprised. I, I don't remember. Um, I haven't done a lot on China yet. China, Maine. I hope to eventually. I mean, I know that the Talberts were there. The Seacoles were there. And we'll have to take a look at that. I would, I would like to find out. I'm not surprised that they are identified differently in different uh, senses. That happens a lot and I don't know why. Uh, of course, each census taker decided themselves on, on what color people were in those days. Uh, it's what I found interesting is Beverly Truman, who came from Louisiana, married a local girl in Norway, Maine. They had 11 children, all of them in Norway are listed as black or mulatto. Every one of them, when they left Norway and went someplace where they didn't, where nobody knew about daddy, they were called white. So. All right, a few more questions. Are there any African-American churches in Maine? If so, have they provided historical information? There are two that I know of in Portland. Uh, one is Green Memorial AME Zion Church up on Sheridan Street in Munjoy Hill. The other one is uh, a temple. Um, I know where it is in Portland. I, I offhand, I don't remember the name, um, but there are two. Have they provided historical information? Most of the historical information from churches have come from the Abyssinian, uh, which was started in around 1828 and went until like 1912. Uh, the and they left a lot of a lot of records that are now at the Maine Historical Society. 
And then as a historian, what is your opinion of race relations in Maine now? <laughs> Loaded question. I, 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 I don't really, I had never thought about that question. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's some good and there's probably some bad. Uh, I don't, as a historian, I'm gonna just keep my mouth shut right now. <laughs> right, you're focused on the past, right? <laughs> there you go. All right, let's see. All right, what do you know about Peterborough, Maine? Peterborough was a, a section of Warren, Maine that the Peters family uh, lived. There were, and I'm, I, there's so many names and things bouncing around my name and I, uh, in my head, and I'm not necessarily the best at, at remembering. That's the reason I write everything down. And now it's, I don't remember exactly where, <laughs> but, but uh, the, the patriarch of the family fought in the Revolutionary War and had part of his ear uh, blown off. He was from Massachusetts. And I think because of the Revolutionary War, he, he got property uh, in, in, up in Warren area. He got married to a woman named Sarah. She came as a slave and her owner sold her to another mariner, another ship captain. She had heard that slaves, remember we were part of Massachusetts. She had heard that the Massachusetts Supreme Court had ruled that slavery was illegal. And so she basically filed suit and won her case. The Peters got to be a large family of them. And there were others, uh, they had other names. Over was one. And I, there were a number of other, Oni, and some other names there that as people moved and married in, and it became a very large community, large, and I'm, I, I, I use these terms, but you have to remember we're talking about blacks which never a huge population, but they became known as Peterborough. They had their own school, they had their own post office, a church. Uh, it is now empty. You can drive by it. There, there is some signage up there that kind of tells you where it is, but it's now basically empty fields. But it was a, a going community at once. What is very interesting about the Peters family is how many of them have served this country in the military. From the Civil War, all, I mean, remember that the Patriarch fought in the Revolutionary War, but they are still fighting in our wars. All right, uh, just two more questions left, it looks like. Uh, what streets on Monjoy Hill? I'm not sure what the question is about. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 lived on, I lived on Lafayette Street, which is what I said that there were at least 10 families. Uh, on my, but there were also uh, black families on Merrill Street, um, on, uh, I can't remember right now, but Lafayette and Merrill were the two main streets that had black families. Okay. And then the Neil Dow House in Portland was supposedly in the Underground Railroad. Any further developments there? Not that I know. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a difficult question to ask, but uh, that's, I mean, it's difficult to answer. Remember one thing about the Underground Railroad. If you let people know who was involved and where, it would have been squashed. 
So it was imperative that it be secretive. And because it was secretive, there's not a whole lot of work. You know, there's not a lot of uh, documentation or anything we can find. So it's who we think may have been there. There are some things that have happened that have been very interesting finds. But, you know, that's the way it goes. All right. Well, that was a marathon of questions. So thank you, Bob. Oh, maybe one more. What can you say about early black educators in rural Maine, if anything? In rural Maine, you had to put that in there, didn't you? Okay. <laughs> there was another question too before that um, that I happened to see. Um, there have been a number. I, I one of the things that has surprised me in going through uh, most of my research is done by going through the very census. And I was quite surprised on how many teachers. Now, again, I, I keep saying how many. I'm not talking about a vast amount. But if you remember uh, the video, Anchor of the Soul, they talk about there were no Black teachers. Well, I have found maybe six, seven, eight, ten in the state over a long period of time. Uh, but I've been surprised on how many there were. I found veterinarians. I found uh, I found a in in Yarmouth a hotel that was owned by a black. Actually, was built by a black man. Uh, in Eastport, there was a hotel that was run by a black man. I don't know if he owned it or what, but he ran it. And so it's been interesting seeing things that I had never heard of before and growing up. So it's, it, it's nice. Um, early black educators in rural Maine, I'm sure that there were more than probably are on the record because if you get somebody that's willing to do it uh, and there's nobody else around, you don't care a whole lot about color. Right. Now, I'm a, I don't know what, what the other one was. There was one I remember seeing and I can't remember it, but I'm sorry if I didn't answer. All right. So lots of kudos for you here. Yes, you're a wonderful researcher, teacher, and guide. Thank you for your important <laughs> research. Thank you very much. All right, folks. We are going to wrap up now. So thank you so much for your time today. This was really wonderful, and I hope everyone here appreciated it. All right, good night, everyone. Good night.